Tonight's meeting is twofold. One, it is to introduce to you the Centre for Secular Space, and I'm incredibly proud to be <coughs> chair of the centre. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in a while. But also to um, to raise awareness, to invite you to be party to a conversation between Dr. Yasuddin Siddiqui, Asif Munir, and Gita Segal. Um, this is a conversation, and we welcome you to join in and ask questions um, when, we, when we get to the point of taking questions. The issue that we're going to talk about is the genocide in Bangladesh in 1971. I have to <coughs> hold my hands up here and say this is something that I knew nothing about. That could be because of my Pakistani heritage, and um, but I also think it's an issue in history that that has been forgotten, that people disregard, and that we need to be talking about and addressing issues that are coming out of that. This is something that has happened in all of our lifetimes. Um, so right, a little bit about the centre, and then I'll come back to the topic of the discussion for the evening. The Centre for Secular Space began as an informal network of experienced human rights activists all of us have worked together for many years on women's rights, on human rights, and working against fundamentalism. <clears throat> and please note the plural there, we're not focusing on what any one specific religion, we're looking at <coughs> fundamentalist beliefs across the world. We came together formally in February 2011, and um, this is our first meeting, and we're raising an issue that, that Gita in particular um, has been working on for many years. So that's a little bit about the, the centre. Um, there's, a, there's a website, so if you just Google Centre for Secular Space, you can find out much more about what we do, publications, and other events that we're holding. Right, back to tonight's meeting. Um, as I said, this is essentially a conversation. We're relaying the story of the work that was done by Deepa and Dr. Siddiqui and Asif. We're going to talk about how their paths have crossed over <coughs> the years. They're witnessing of momentous events in history. But also through this conversation, we want to raise some really important questions about human rights, about those that we raise and those that we challenge, about the connections between blasphemy and genocide. But it's also a conversation that's taking place against the backdrop of, a, of an ever-changing world. We've had the Arab Spring, we have the growth of, of religious lobbies, but also the very recent publication of Salman Rushdie's memoir, which includes his experience of the fatwa against him following publication of the Satanic Verses. This conversation is, is between actors who were sometimes on opposite sides of the Rushdie affair, Gita and Dr. Siddiqui in particular. Their stories, their experiences of then and now. But it's also about the genocide. I just want to say a little bit um, about the, the genocide. As I said, I, I knew almost nothing um, about what just happened. Of course, I knew about the war between Pakistan and Bangladesh. And there were a couple of... Um, there's, a, there's a comment particularly from Robert Payne, um, who wrote a book the year after the end of the war. And he said that the Bangladesh genocide was amongst the most centrally and carefully planned of modern genocides. And in his writing, he ranks this up with the atrocities in the Soviet Union and the Holocaust of the Jews. The numbers are always contested. The estimates are of three million people murdered. The figures could be higher, the figures could be less. <coughs> there is also the elitist side of getting rid of professionals, of teachers, of office bearers, a targeted attack on the people of Bangladesh, but also the gender side, the targeting of males in the same way that we saw in the Balkans in recent years. This conflict also had a terrible, brutal sexual violence as a major component of its strategy. And violence against women is, is often seen as separate and distinct from discussions of the Bangladesh genocide, and even more separate from discussions of blasphemy. Our conversation tonight will hopefully bring together a number of these issues. They are interlinked and they are interconnected. That, I think, is enough from me. Um, I'm going to um, introduce um, our, three, um, our three actors. Um, Asif Munir is the youngest son 
of Munir Jodri, who was murdered on the 14th of December 1971. He is the founder member of Prajamo 71, an organisation um, of the Children of the Martyrs of Liberation. He's a cultural and human rights activist in Bangladesh and a development professional. <coughs> Dr. Siddiqui, with whom I have a, a long-standing um, friendship and working relationship, is a political activist. He's a former director of the Muslim Institute and has been involved in child protection issues and tackling violence against women, including forced marriage and non-based violence. And he's published several reports on these issues and helped to develop the Muslim marriage contract. And on to Geetha, finally. Um, gosh, how do you describe Geetha Segal? She's one of my closest friends. She's a writer, a documentary filmmaker, and the co-editor of Refusing Holy Orders, Women and Fundamentalisms in Britain. She's written extensively on, on gender um, for the American Society of International Law, Women Living Under Muslim Law, and Open Democracy. I hand you over to Geetha Asif and Dr. Siddiqui. Thank you, Yasmin. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is really quite an extraordinary turnout for a meeting that's organized at such short notice. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to see uh, all of you here. Um, and I think that among you, there are people who carry um, very personal memories of uh, the topic we're going to discuss. And there are also <coughs> people who, um, uh, unlike what you said, Yasmin, are probably weren't born, because there are people much younger than us here who were not born when it happened and um, perhaps have never uh, heard it discussed uh, very much. Because what one of the th topics that we're going to explore um, is the relationship between genocide and blasphemy. And that is a relationship which is usually not brought together by people who work in formal human rights organizations um, and even academics working on these issues. I mean, maybe somebody in the audience who is an academic, I'm not, can tell us if, if they know of material which has discussed this, because I don't. And I think it's a large absence in work on genocide studies and um, conflict. Um, because usually people working on freedom of expression, uh, on defending writers, artists and so on, work on blasphemy issues. And uh, people working on war and conflict and uh, looking at war crimes and crimes against humanity um, and uh, uh, genocide, uh, look at those issues in relation to international humanitarian law and criminal law. And somehow when these things get professionalized, they, they split apart. And yet when you see the issues that we're going to discuss today, that we see that they're intimately linked uh, because the people promoting one quite frequently promote the other, or rather, shall we say, the people who might commit one, which is genocide, frequently have the issue of blasphemy and control of speech and um, uh, in, uh, as one of the major planks of their politics. Now, um, I know that Dr. Siddiqui very much <coughs> wanted to make an opening statement before we get into the, are you sure? No. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to men welcome both um, Asif Munir and Dr. Giyasuddin Siddiqui very much to this panel because both of them in different <coughs> ways take risks in talking about this issue. Um, Asif talks about it as a child of um, what are called martyrs of the liberation war, people who were victims um, of the struggle. Dr. Siddiqui takes, I think, a very brave risk in coming to talk to us tonight because for a large part of a very active life as a political activist, he was on the other side of this struggle. And he um, is going to share his experiences with us, both from within the space of um, a fundamentalist movement um, uh, and a particular group associated with the jamaat e islami uh, but also his journey uh, to sharing a panel with us and sharing issues with us and fighting for accountability with us. So um, I'm going to start with Asif and 
ask you us if why, you know, you were very young when the war happened, but you've grown up with narratives about it. So why do you think that um, it, you know, what, what were your memories of, of that um, uh, as, as you were growing up? And why do you believe that it is a genocidal conflict? Thank you, Gita. And uh, I'm also kind of privileged in uh, speaking in this kind of uh, atmosphere and this uh, conversation. Um, see, for me, it was uh, cathartic personally, but also as growing up, like when I was introduced being said that as a human rights activist and a cultural activist uh, at different points in time, when I, in my student days, in the university student days, I was actually on the streets uh, for you know, screaming about democracy and, you know, against autocracy. Uh, but as a child, uh, I was four years old in 1971, so very young to remember anything. But I grew up with the uh, absence of my father in unusual circumstances and then actually knowing why. And what I've learned over the years is that uh, it was because of people like him and their beliefs that they were systematically targeted, and uh, you know, the uh, there were selected intellectuals who were picked up, deliberately picked up, and uh, killed. For my father, he actually disappeared. We never found his dead body, or it was never identified. We could never identify. So it was at a personal level a personal loss. But then growing up, uh, that why he was killed because of his, of his idealist uh, idealism and uh, the Bengali nationalism, which was quite secular, the views that my father held and people like them held. And that's something that I grew up with. So in terms of genocide, I would say that, you know, it was the intent or the intention that certain people, okay, there were certain intellectuals who were targeted, but there were also mass killings, there's debates about numbers and all that. But uh, these were systematic killings. Uh, sort of to uh, wipe out certain groups of people because of their beliefs, not because of, you know, uh, confrontational or, you know, in war situations or whether two parties are actual in, in the battlefield. So uh, being uh, coming from that and actually playing a role in terms of understanding, I grew up with a generation which has kind of uh, mixed knowledge and feelings about the liberation war. There's been all sorts of confusion created in the history books as we grew up, a distorted history of, of how Bangladesh was created. And a generation and, and a generation after me, I can see a lot of people younger than me, who I can probably say, you know, the next generation after me, who have even uh, in Bangladesh itself, have a very distorted understanding of uh, what happened actually in 1971? Well, I'd say, you know, you're talking about a distorted understanding. There's a, there are numerous narratives about the war. And I think never more than today has the issue of whether this was genocide or not been challenged. And it's being challenged in academic journals, uh, you know, of genocide research. Um, it's being challenged uh, 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 certainly by people um, uh, who uh, took the part of Pakistan in relation in relation to it, um, who've always, you know, their narrative has always been this was a civil war and an internal conflict. Um, so I think we're going to come back to this issue because the issue of intent. I mean, the, the genocide is not just mass killing. That you you could have a set of um, very very um, uh, widespread and large conflict which might amount to war crimes or crimes against humanity, where a lot of civilians are killed but it might still not meet the definition of genocide. And the definition of genocide comes about where there is intent to um, uh, destroy in whole or in part a particular group. Now that group cannot, at least in the definition, in the, in the classic definition of the genocide convention, does not include political groups. And that's why, for instance, um, when um, Bangladesh actually passed um, laws immediately afterwards, they did include uh, political groups because their experience was that, that political people who were nationalists had been targeted as well. Although the Genocide Convention doesn't, and therefore Cambodia, for instance, which came after Bangladesh, um, people had difficulty 
describing Cambodia as a genocide because it was the Khmer Rouge actually killing most of the Cambodian population, but it was thought to be on political grounds, and therefore uh, nobody thought class or any other issue that might have been implicated would um, come into it. Now, Dr. Siddiqui, from your point of view, what do you feel, you know, having observed uh, the conflict from the outside, I mean, you were here in Britain at the time, you were an activist, so if you could please describe to us where you were situated politically and what you were doing, and how uh, the conflict appeared to you at that time. Well, thank you, Geeta. Mm -hmm. First of all, just a brief account of me. Mm -hmm. I was a student uh, at Karachi University and part of Islamic Jamiyat Talaba, which is student wing of Jamaat Islami. And uh, I was the head of university unit of Jamiyat Talaba. Uh, and somehow, as a result of working as part of Jamiyat Talaba, um, I began to understand its theology's approach and everything. And I see this. Uh, as a genocide, the reason being its ideology, because Jamaat Islami's ideology is based on Salafism, which divides human being based on your belief, uh, us and them. And the fact that uh, Bangladesh, or previously East Pakistan, was being led by a move Awami League, which in the eyes of Jamaat Islami, a party influenced, manipulated, uh, controlled by Hindus or Hindu ideology, and uh, taking Pakistan away from Islam. Obviously, it was Islamic responsibility to eliminate that threat, and uh, that part going away separating from Pakistan. Obviously, as far as Jamaat Islami was concerned, it has been established to establish uh, God's will. And uh, so they were traitors. Uh, me, uh, can I just stop you for a moment? Excuse me, there are people filming here who haven't asked permission to film. If I can ask you to shut it off. It's going to be on YouTube. And uh, so you, you're very welcome to analyze the meeting as much as you like. Thank you. So, uh, so <coughs> before I left Islamic Jamiyat Talba, Eastern Wing, so I was, as I said, head of Jamiyat at Karachi University. And in those days, uh, Karachi, in Karachi, there was only one university. There are a number of them. So uh, this shows. And of course, as an activist, even within the Jamiyat, um, I was also part of a group within Jamiyat, which was, as we believe, part to ensure that Jamiyat remains the controlling factor of Karachi. Nothing will happen in Karachi without our consent or approval. We will go and smash places, destroy places. And some of this I'll explain later. How do we do it? Well, in uh, obviously, Bangladesh war uh, started in uh, 1971. It so happened that uh, I finished my PhD in chemical engineering from Sheffield University, and you can see how mad I was. It's just after my oral examination, I put <coughs> my thesis in the library and said, that is end. I'm not going to touch this book again. And I went straight to London. I came straight to London, where I have already agreed that we were going to publish a monthly magazine called Impact International. Some of you may have heard its name. And there were three people who was uh, part of this team, uh, a friend called Hashir Faruqi, who was the editor, and me and another uh, friend, Abdul Wahid Hamid. Three of us were part of the team. But before we started publishing uh, this magazine, it was an agreement that, of course, Muslim community in Britain needs a voice. But it was essential 
and in fact I made sure that it will be an independent publication, not a party political broadcast. So when I joined this, immediately after uh, this uh, war in Bangladesh started, I think our army action started in March uh, 1971. And obviously monthly paper is not a daily paper, but of course still there are deadlines. But my task was to go around and collect data information about the events taking place in London and elsewhere uh, between the French Muslim community. So I, uh, one of my tasks used to be to go to Hyde Park to attend uh, uh, meetings, gatherings, and also other meetings, gatherings. And I started <coughs> reading back to my uh, uh, editor that there is a big event taking place and we should cover it. But soon I realized that uh, our editor was getting some notes from elsewhere, outside, how to run, how to cover. And I said, look, I mean, you know, we have agreed to be independent. Uh, this is not acceptable. But that went on. So a few months later, I tendered my resignation. I said, look, this is in violation of our agreement that you will be fair, independent, but uh, you have become uh, basically mouthpiece of Pakistan army. Uh, so what was the kind of information that was coming out in impact? Because this, this was aimed at British, you know, British Muslims over here. So what was being said? I, I, obviously, it's a long time. Yeah. I don't have uh, past copies of newspaper. I don't remember it. And also, when I left, I was very angry. Because here I've left my whatever career I had, one could imagine, and there, just a few months later, I, was, I had a problem with this. <coughs> uh, so I uh, left, but I think what I heard, read, and talked about was obviously Jamaat Islami was supporting the army action, and many youth and students group were becoming part of uh, uh, various groups like Badr and Al Shams. And I could hear stories of their ac action, what they have done, how they have been involved in killing of, uh, obviously, for them, kuffar. Uh, uh, so it was very d distressing because as a student in 1962, I had gone to, at that time, East Pakistan. And I met uh, young people, students. And I was, you know, very happy that obviously they were critical of what was happening to them, the Pakistan Army establishment. But uh, I mean, even we were in West Pakistan were uh, supporting that it is a country uh, control and rule for the benefit of the army. So this was not something surprising. But so, but I was able to meet people there. I went to Dhaka. I went to Cheragong, uh, uh, Kumilla and sell at uh, hill tracks and so on. So I was able to f frequent acquaint myself with the people and their aspirations. So when this war started and our responsibility as a journalist, as a newspaper people, I saw that uh, there is no reference or coverage of those aspirations, it was very frustrating. And as a result, of course, I, I, I left it. And you said you actually um, saw the first demonstration in favor of Bangladeshi independence. Uh, yeah. yeah. In I mean, Park. as part of my duty, mm -hmm. I used to go. And I remember first going to one of the uh, demonstration when, for the first time, slogan, Joy Bangla, was raised. And obviously, it was something uh, uh, curious, new for the, the audience as well, yes. As in victory to Bangladesh, B Joy yeah. Bangla. I, yeah. So um, the, I, I want you to talk a little bit about kufr. What, what does it mean in the context of a conflict breaking out? Because if you understand this, I mean, one, what is its religious significance and what is its political significance in the context of the conflict? I, I think we have to understand uh, the Muslim political thought in India. There have always been two 
uh, narratives, interpretations. There was one which was Salafist, it started in 15th, 16th century during the time of Akbar. Uh, there was a religious, famous religious leader called Sheikh Ahmad Sarhandi. His position was that it's our responsibility because we have given our blood, sacrifices, everything, that we make sure that uh, uh, Islamic rules, aspirations are met here in this country, in India. And he was uh, obviously, we're talking about Mughal India. But of course, there were other people like Akbar and many other scholars who thought that we live in a multicultural ethnic country and we have to make sure that we incorporate aspirations of all the people, both Hindus and Muslims. But this, of course, has gone on and on. And uh, the last famous emperor, Mughal emperor, was Aurangzeb. And it's very interesting that uh, he, before becoming, of course, uh, leader or king, he killed one of, of his brothers uh, called Dara Shiko, famous, famous person. One of his criteria contribution of Dara Shiko was he was a translator of Bhagavad Gita, Hindu religious book. And as a result of his translation into Persian at that time, because Persian was the state language, court language of Mughal India. He became very influenced for, for its spiritualism. And his position was spiritualism only stems from belief in God, one God. And it's not possible. And he saw that there is a possibility, a basis, where Hindu and Muslim together can build a civilization. But of course, once Darashiko was defeated uh, in battlefield. Uh, uh, obviously, Aurangzeb wanted to punish and pu punish according to Islamic law. What is the important thing is that Aurangzeb was disciple of one of the uh, 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 religious leaders of Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi. He was obviously uh, uh, declared as murtad and as an apostate apostate yeah. and then killed so it's very very important and this so this conflict in muslim societies in india has continued and in fact it was clash of these uh, ideologies understanding that led to partition of india as well of course pakistan was created as a land for to promote islamic ideals to establish Islamic State and so on and so forth. But soon, Maulana Madhudi, who was founder, should have realized that uh, uh, the state was nothing other than a platform for the Pakistan army to exploit, manipulate, and control the resources of Pakistan. I mean, recently I was in a Stop the I War Coalition. To, uh, we'll get to the Stop okay. the War Coalition. I don't want to get ahead to that. But I want to go back to Asif at precisely that point, because, of course, this was one of the reasons that um, uh, a national movement started uh, uh, in what was then East Pakistan. And I want you to reflect a bit, Asif, at how this idea of kufr played out in the people who, you know, did it, do you think that was the main um, thrust of the army, the Pakistan army, uh, you know, who were the people for whom this idea was important in relation to the conflict um, in Bangladesh? Yeah, I mean, if we look at uh, <clears throat> who were the people who were targeted in 1971, not just the intellectuals like my <coughs> father, but also other people, one of the narratives, I mean, you talked about the different narratives, one of the things that was about uh, that <coughs> the uh, people who are sort of pro-Hindu or anti-Muslim. So these people were targeted. And kind of the narrative that uh, whether either the Hindu minority at that time in East Pakistan or Muslims who were Hindu sympathizers would be targeted. And they were the initial targets. You talked about the crackdown on 25th March. I mean, uh, on 25th March, midnight, past midnight, the attacks that happened in the university 
one of the first attacks was in a dormitory where there was predominantly Hindu students, the uh, Jagannath Hall. A uh, lot of the other students who were targeted, teachers who were picked up, were Hindu teachers. Gradually, it expanded to sympathizers, supposed sympathizers. Now, when uh, the uh, soon after partition, I know that people like my father and a lot of other progressive people, they uh, talked about, and it comes through a lot of the writings and, and there are some of the, uh, you know, their uh, intellectual writings or speeches, that. They talked about that this is not the kind of country we wanted. You know, the two-nation theory that, okay, based on, on the basis of religion, the Hindu majority and the uh, Muslim majority, was not a reality, at least in East Pakistan, because it was a, 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 a cultural divide between West Pakistan and East Pakistan. There are a lot of similarities in the cultural tradition uh, of all the different three countries. So you could not just divide a nation based on the, on religion. So what happened after 47 was that a lot of people felt disillusioned that this is not what we kind of looked for. Now, the people who were outspoken at that time were targets from time and again. I mean, I, I can speak from the personal experience that I wasn't born even then in the 1950s, but my father spoke out about the Bengali language movement in 1952, where, uh, which was, you know, when Urdu was supposedly said to be the, or declared to be the state religion, the uh, state <coughs> language. And uh, there was a movement in East, East Pakistan that, in East Pakistan where the majority speaks Bengali, Urdu cannot be the uh, state language, at least in East Pakistan. So. A lot of students, teachers at that time were part of the movements uh, from 1950s to 60s. And they were the targets by the West Pakistan regime, essentially the army at that time. They were incarcerated, imprisoned, tortured, and time and again they were the targets. So the backlash to the people who were a little bit more, uh, had a little bit more the Bengali nationalistic view who believed in secularism and, and that, you know, that in, in East Pakistan at least, people could live together and respect each other, they were targeted time and again. And that was a culmination in 1971. through so a lot of movements. I mean, 1971, of course, was a big landmark, but there were movements. There was the movement in 1969, student movement, and of course the movement back in 1952. So since creation of Pakistan, uh, uh, of the two nation theory uh, or, or the partition in 1947 there was never really any peace in east pakistan at least because the west was trying to exploit like uh, you rightly said because of the resources and and all the different things that were happening the what i'm trying to um, tease out is that W there, there, was, there were a number of arguments you're talking about between what was then East Pakistan and West Pakistan. There was the cultural the discussion about the Bengali language, a huge language movement, um, and there was a resource argument. So these are sort of so cultural and economic arguments that um, uh, where there was opposition to um, being controlled by West Pakistan, and particularly by the army in West Pakistan. But what I didn't know, you see, for, for me growing up in India, uh, the, the conflict was a, was a huge um, experience of my childhood. It was something that affected any Indian of my generation who was conscious at that time. Um, beca because it is, till today, uh, one of the largest conflict that the region has known. Um, and, you know, we can look much further than the region. And we've been at war in one way or another within countries, between countries, um, you know, f since, since um, 47 onwards. Um, but what I didn't know until I began to do some investigative work in the 1990s uh, on the issue um, of, of the conflict was that actually the killings were not committed only by the Pakistan army against um, East uh, Bengalis. Um, they were also committed by people who were themselves Bengali. 
and they were uh, associated, uh, among others, with the Jamaat Islami and with their student wing, which, as Dr. Siddiqui describes, that he knew from its Pakistan side. Um, uh, there were, you know, allegations that these were the ones, and indeed, it was a squad um, that was known as the Al Badr, which we believe picked up your father. <coughs> Uh, in the very, very dying days of the war, on the 14th of December, just two days before the Pakistan army surrendered. Um, so w what, what do you remember, you know, what, what was known or <coughs> investigated about these, you know, what was their driver? Uh, what led them to do what they did? I think, um, again, in terms of, I think that it was kind of uh, trying to gain uh, sort of their own political space uh, in that kind of scenario. Of course, the initial attack was from uh, the West Pakistan regime at that point, but they were looking for, of course, local allies. But because again, culturally, uh, economically, there were a lot of differences between West and uh, and East Pakistan, and the West Pakistan regime needed local allies to actually know a little bit about in terms of who they want to target. Because otherwise, of course, there were general mass killings of civilians. But when they wanted to target certain people, they needed inside information. Uh, <coughs> Pro-Jamaat people or even you know, the Jamaat <coughs> activists or uh, sort of fundamentalist activists saw this as an opportunity to be in the good books of the West Pakistanis. because they perhaps felt that uh, this is kind of good for them as a political uh, party uh, because, again, in terms of the common language of perhaps religion, but that's what they thought. And uh, perhaps if the tables were turned at that time, if history was different, they probably would be leading, uh, you know, they actually did um, have a leading position in the politics later on because of all the different things that happened in Bangladesh. But at that point, probably the calculation was that, okay, if we side with certain parties and, you know, it's like a win-win situation for them, uh, perhaps. But also <laughs> that what I'm trying to connect it to um, is that the issuance of um, orders to kill or... Um, uh, fatwas or uh, statements of various kinds, whether through the newspapers or whether through um, other means, um, was connected to people being seen as, as you said, pro-Hindu or Hindu. In other words, they were not good Muslims. They were not the right kind of Muslim. Uh, because many of them, of course, were Muslims uh, who were targeted. So the minorities were targeted because they were minorities. And in the recent discussions that have been taking place around issues um, uh, where, where these issues are being uh, tried um, at the International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh, um, uh, Ambassador Rapp who, um, uh, from the US who's been um, making comments and advising on the tribunal and uh, sometimes critical of the tribunal, but one of the comments that he made uh, was that, um, that where, um, that only the killings of minorities could be regarded as genocidal. Whereas if um, uh, the killings of Bengali on Bengali and Muslim on Muslim could not be regarded as genocidal. And I think what I'm trying to tease out, and that's why I asked you about the Kufur point, Dr. Yeah. Siddiqui, is why, wh you know, I f find that a mechanistic understanding of what genocidal, uh, what a genocidal campaign might mean. Because even in much more recent times, we have uh, the example of Darfur, for instance, where people who are uh, racially, you know, racialized in different ways and are culturally different, there, there's a war, has been a war going on, which was uh, by many has been considered a genocidal war, and that's Muslim on Muslim. Um, uh, so you have, on the one hand, you have the Pakistani attack on East Bengalis, and you have a lot of racialized language coming into that uh, and that contempt. But when you have the religious attack of Bengali on Bengali, you have the language, if I'm not wrong, of, of belief. 
coming absolutely, into it. Absolutely, absolutely. So how do you do you recall <coughs> they, they discussions were, around this? Yeah, yeah, of course, because I think uh, what was important was that uh, Bengalis. I mean, the argument was that they are less pure Muslim because they follow a Hindu culture. An example was uh, uh, singing and dancing, which was uh, associated with Hindu culture they, they, the Bengalis were adopting without realizing that uh, uh, in different settings, uh, singing and dancing existed in Muslim culture as well. Uh, Sufis were already involved in both acts, although uh, not comparable, because there were uh, different manifestations. But uh, I mean, singing and dancing existed uh, there. But uh, these were used as influence, a manifestation of Hindu culture in Muslim society. And of course, uh, they were going to dominate the affairs of Pakistan and so on and so forth, and this has to be stopped. And of course, they ignored the fact there's plenty of singing and dancing in Punjabi cultures as well. Yes, you of know, course. West yes. Pakistani that's, cultures that's, of various that's, kinds. That's right. <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah. there. So they were trying but, to but, reform but, but every kind of I culture. I think what has happened <laughs> is that perhaps uh, all these Punjabi uh, dancing and singing existed more before Pakistan, because the new Pakistani culture was uh, Salafi influenced obviously had some uh, uh, curtailment of that. I think one of the stories that, that struck me most, um, Asif, about the, um, the, the, this last episode, which was called The Killing of the Intellectuals, where, 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 where your father was picked up, was um, an incident <coughs> where a survivor from a torture center um, was interviewed by us. And I'd, I'd like you to talk about that a little, because actually, we didn't use a lot of what he said uh, in the film, but what, what he talked about was the cultural attack, um, the torture of people who, who were taunted because they were Tagore scholars and because they loved Bengali. Um, and th this has particularly haunted me because it's very hard to imagine that somebody who is a beloved poet um, well, across the subcontinent, but particularly in Bengal, both East and West, and who was a Nobel Prize winner and stood for peace, um, whose name could then, you know, be used as an excuse to kill. Uh, you're right. I mean, it was used. I mean, I know that my father was actually uh, protesting the banning of use of uh, Tagore songs in radio and television. And radio and television was just starting up late in the late 60s in that part of uh, East Pakistan. And it was banned, officially banned, that you cannot play uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, you know, songs or whatever, poems. Um, now, a uh, lot of the, uh, and this person who actually was a survivor from one of the killing fields, uh, it still gives me shivers to actually, you know, uh, remember what he was talking about. See, um, it was a planned attack. I mean, it talked about that already, that, you know, all through 1971, uh, you know, figures are, of course, debated, but around, uh, widely said that around 1,000 intellectuals were targeted and killed. But in December, two weeks of December, from 1st December to 15th, in, during these two weeks, about 200 uh, intellectuals were picked up and killed. And a lot of them actually disappeared, like my father. Their bodies were never found. Um, but uh, people like, person like this person, who actually was a survivor from one of the killing fields, talked about how they were taken into certain, you know, torture chambers, and where he actually said that he heard, uh, you know, names of certain university teachers being said, and, you know, the things that they believed in. And again and again, they were said that you are a Hindu sympathizer, you are a you are, uh, you know, a shame to a Muslim name, even if that person was Muslim. So that, and that was also not just by the Pakistan army. There were, uh, you know, these Al-Badr, Rajakars, these were people, these were Bengali-speaking Bengali people. Uh, my father was uh, picked up by two, three Bengali boys, not by the army. And my uncle who was there, and he, gave his witness later, you know, a testimony later on. 
um, they also believe the same thing. They kind of echoed what the Pakistani regime said, but of course, again, because of their own political gain. So, uh, trying to target certain people because of their beliefs and because of the cultural uh, tradition, trying to isolate that that this is the Bengali culture is more a Hindu culture. So we need to move away from that and establish a more Muslim or Islamic culture. And incidentally, fact, incidentally this, uh, among minorities, it's not only Hindus were killed, but also Christians were killed as well. Yes. Although, of course, Christians were in a small number. Yeah. And also, just to add to what you're saying, that this whole uh, uh, debate about uh, Tagore and Iqbal, uh, there is a lot of discussion in West Pakistan has gone on. That somehow, Nobel Prize Committee preferred a Hindu uh, rather than Muslim uh, uh, in terms of giving. Uh, 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 but then, uh, at one stage, I also was influenced with this argument that how come this is happening? And I studied both Tagore and uh, 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 Iqbal. And then I realized that there is a difference between the two. Tagore talks about universal values. And, and Iqbal talks about sectarian values. Because when we will control the world, then we will give freedom, not before. <laughs> so then I realized that obviously why uh, the Nobel Prize Committee selected one, not the other one. Please. Well, I want to move us forward. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Siddiqui, to ask you, do you remember what happened after the war? Um, was there an influx of people from what then became Bangladesh who came to England at that time? Did you meet any of them? No, I didn't know more, but I did hear with some friends some of the stories, uh, uh, the part al uh, played uh, in killing people. That was the only thing that uh, I came to know. Well, I, I, I want to ask Asif briefly that um, it said that there was an amnesty after the war and, you know, all these matters were put to rest. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Briefly? briefly, I mean, of course, there was the international politics which was there. I mean, you know, we all know all of that a little bit in terms of uh, the sort of the global superpowers and the different sides that that was taking. Uh, and uh, the initially when uh, Bangladesh was created or, you know, after 16th December, uh, there were certain countries which first recognized Bangladesh as a new state and certain countries later on. And uh, the, a lot of the more sort of Muslim majority countries were uh, sort of recognizing it a bit later than uh, earlier. Now, what happened... Uh, Around that time, uh, can you repeat your question again? Was well, that there was a, the, the, there said to be an amnesty that sort of right. ended all the yeah. issues of the war. Now, so. there's of course a lot of uh, debates, and I think there's a lot of twist of words. I mean, the history goes that you know there were a certain number of prisoners of war at that time when uh, you know uh, the surrender was made on 16 December, so Pakistani prisoners of war, but under the Geneva Convention. You know, prisoners of war were, were exchanged, but there was also kind of an intent expressed, and you know, there are a lot of things in the history books that Pakistan regime and Bhutto himself uh, said that given the prisoners, I mean, once they have the prisoners of war back, they would have trials held under Pakistani law in Pakistan. So based on that goodwill, yeah. uh, certain an amnesty was given, but even then, people who were involved in direct crime of killing, arsoning, raping in 1971, they were not pardoned. So they, that was still there. But if we know the history of Bangladesh, while this sort of, uh, you know, the initial few years, um, there's a lot of debate about that, whether the post-independent government had an intention to try or take the trials forward or not. But, uh, you know, there was very little time up between 72 to 75. And the regimes afterwards, there was a systematic effort 
to actually, you know, put this into the back burner. So that never really came up. The Just to add to what happened is, of course, when the uh, 90,000 prisoners of war came back to Pakistan from wherever, mainly India, I think a commission was set up in Pakistan called Hamidur Rahman Commission. I think it was, uh, 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 and uh, it submitted a report, I think in six months later, in July 1972, but it accepted, uh, although there was a dispute, disagreement over the number of people killed, the number of women who were raped, but they also accepted that uh, a large proportion of Hindus were killed. And also, they identified a number of army officers who need to be tried. But because, obviously, in Pakistan, army controls everything, this report was never published. And it so happened the report uh, was published by India, somehow leaked out. And then, of course, it was uh, 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 came into circulation within Pakistan. But it did, uh, obviously, uh, uh, suggest that a number of uh, uh, army officers should be tried for uh, whatever crimes they have committed. But, um, uh, but of course, they, they weren't tried, and, and the no, trials had tried, originally taken place in Bangladesh, some under Collaborators Act, but some other <coughs> uh, uh, trials were also stopped. And as you said, um, uh, many people won't know this history. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was... Uh, uh, considered the father of the nation, the first prime minister, the founder of the nation, was murdered uh, in yeah. an army coup, yeah. uh, brutally murdered with, with uh, about 18 members of his family. And so that's what Asif was referring to, where he said that um, between 72 and 75 was a very short time to deal with, uh, with a very new nation struggling to come into being, to deal with these massive issues of um, uh, crimes uh, committed. I can just uh, add a little bit of anecdotal story. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I heard from uh, when my father was picked up, there was my elder brother who actually opened the gate and my uncle. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it from my brother. He's, uh, he's, uh, he departed last year. But I heard from him that uh, sometime in 1972, they were actually taken to identify in a panel of uh, supposed prisoners. Uh, both my uncle and, and my brother. Uh, of course, there was a lot of confusion, and you know they were partly masked. Uh, they, later on, they removed their mask. Uh, but even then, there was at least one person, which was common for both my uncle and my brother. Mm. But what happened to that, we never found out, and mm. they never knew. It kind of got lost in the sort of political milieu over the years. But there was an attempt to sort of you know, this is from a personal story that I know. Well, I mean, that was one of the things that struck me when I was um, looking at this issue, was that when we began to talk to people, um, and, and I think we have to keep this in mind, particularly because of the, the, the way in which the issues are being raised now as um, a political attack by the Awami League on the, on the leadership of uh, opposition <coughs> political parties. Now, I think, you know, there is, there is a factual aspect to it. There are... Um, members of the opposition political parties in the leadership of the opposition in the B BNP and the jamaat e islami who are being indicted in the current trial process taking place. And um, I'm going to announce later another meeting on the issues of the tribunal because we want to explore some of these wider issues and not immediately go to issues of uh, uh, the tribunal and, and um, exactly what it's doing and how it's functioning. Um, but uh, at what, what I think we must bear in mind is that many of the people whose names have come up um, in the indictments, including one of the men I investigated, whose name I couldn't have spoken until the tribunal actually said that we are investigating allegations against this person, that, that is a man called Chaudhry Moinuddin, who has been active in this country as a political activist um, over a whole range of... Um, issues and an advisor to the Labour government and, uh, you know, prominent at various times in the East London Mosque and uh, found, I think, a founder of Islamic Forum Europe and um, now I think a health advisor in a very senior position. Um, so a man embedded as an active citizen in this country um, is being investigated by a tribunal in 
in Bangladesh, which is accused of being uh, an absolutely political uh, tribunal. Now, when I began to investigate this issue, um, I didn't see, uh, uh, well, at that time, the, the people who were being investigated were not necessarily in the leadership positions they're in now. Um, they, you know, they were, they were people who, uh, and in fact, I didn't realize that some of the leads and the investigative leads that we had would lead to people who were living under the same names that they operated in. I mean, you know, they, were, they had not changed their identities or transformed themselves in any way. They were living as themselves in this country, um, active in the, in the politics of this country, in Muslim politics of this country. Um, and I was, I was surprised by that because I, I didn't know who they were. I mean, in other words, we didn't say we must go and target some individual who's at the head of a political party. We followed the leads of people who had, who had been recognized at times like this when they had been picked up. And in one case, um, Moinuddin had been recognized because he was the student of one of the men who, was, who, who also, obviously, like your father, worked in the university and knew people. And I think this is another element of um, a conflict of this nature, whether it's a genocidal conflict or a very widespread conflict where crimes against humanity are committed, is that in many cases, the conflict is of a very intimate nature. The people who are involved in the pickups know the people who they're picking up. They know who to target because they have studied or been in their vicinity. <coughs> this is not people who are targeting somebody who's a distant other. They're targeting people who are very close to them. And it's that it's, it, it, it is the use of violence to destroy people who are considered kufar, who are considered pro-Hindu, who are considered pro-Tagore, um, who are considered the wrong sort of people. Um, uh, you know, and, and the people who know who to target are precisely the ones who move inside the society, not the people like the I army who move outside it. I not um, discussed the cases of rapes during that time which have taken place, large number of rapes taken place at that time. I think Massive, yes. Well, uh, Yasmin mentioned it briefly. I mean, yeah. I wrote an article for Open Democracy recently where I, I described Bangladesh as a for forgotten template of 20th, 20th century war because in 71 when Bangladesh happened, Yugoslavia hadn't happened, Rwanda hadn't yeah. happened, yeah. Um, the international tribunals that have taken place hadn't happened. Um, so the international law that exists now in dealing with these issues had not happened. So in and that sense, uh, Pakistan is the first <laughs> to establish uh, in using rapes as a uh, political weapon. Well, it had happened in the yeah. se Second World War and yeah. in many yeah. other wars. Yeah. But yeah. I think in, 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 in the modern phase of war, through um, the operation of yeah. religious ideology yeah. and a fundamentalist movement, I yeah. think we... We, 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 you know, we see something that uh, seems because to be different in kind. This is one of the areas with the, with, which is within Pakistani communities have been discussed. How many women were raped? Uh, my my uh, position has always been that even if one woman was raped, it was too many. We simply <coughs> cannot accept because rape basically destroys the individual who s suffers that kind of uh, uh, experience. So, but uh, uh, but uh, in Pakistani communities, uh, the effort has been just to reduce the number only very few. Uh, and this has not been properly debated. But I feel very strongly because I was obviously uh, uh, involved in women issues forced marriages and domestic violence, honor killing, and so on and so forth. And I've seen how this act basically destroys the individual. So it's very, very serious. And I, I, I think you're right there, that um, there is now more academic work being done. There, are, there also has always been activist work being done around this issue. What hasn't been done, really, and that's why the subtitle of the meeting is what human rights, anti-racist, and peace organizations won't tell you, is that after 72, not a single of the major human rights organizations has published 
an investigative report on any of the issues of violations in the war, whether, whether it's about women, which they, in, the, in the 70s, they, you know, women were hardly subjects of human rights. So really, there was virtually no work done on sexual violence and rape, but not even on other violations that had um, been openly discussed. And you know, there, there is a huge gap in that material where it is activists like Asif and people who we know in, in this country who have been mobilizing and organizing and producing materials and people who are journalists like myself who almost stumbled into this issue um, and, and uh, began to work on it, who have produced the work that um, you know, made sure that there was a push for accountability. But meanwhile, over here, um, uh, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, I want to go back to the period, you know, 10 years or so on from, um, from 71, in the late 80s, where on the one hand we have a period in the, in, in the subcontinent, in both in Bangladesh and in um, Pakistan, of a period of Islamicization, yes. where you have uh, military rulers yeah. working with fundamentalists, yeah promoting um, laws on uh, what we call the Hudud ordinances in Pakistan on, yeah. on um, uh, criminalizing sex outside marriage, the Zina laws, criminalizing blasphemy. Um, and uh, in Bangladesh, you have a slightly different story, do you not, Asif? What happened was that all through the 1980s, there was a very vibrant civil society uh, movement against that. There were a lot of uh, students' uh, movements that was involved in that, a lot of local activist groups, civil society groups, even local uh, human rights groups were very much uh, pushing towards both against autocracy but also against, uh, also trying to revive the uh, basic principles of 1971 uh, liberation movement, which was more secular, and bringing it to the forefront. And... Uh, you know, using the media. I myself was a cultural activist in those days. So creating a lot of music, songs, street theater, that was very much used. And that created a kind of a public opinion, which culminated actually, you know, the outthrow of the um, army regime. Uh, in the 90s. In, in 1990. And, and that was the start of actually bringing the accountability issues back into um, the public domain. But I think we, you know, we need to note that this, these civil society movements are not successful in every way, but in some key ways, they did manage to limit what, uh, things that were not limited in Pakistan. So for instance, there was no hudud or ordinances or, or anything like that. There was no criminalization of zina. There was, um, although Islam was the state religion, um, there was no blasphemy law passed. Um, you know, that, that was fended off. Ahmadiyyas were not uh, declared non-Muslim in Bangladesh. So although there were, uh, 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 I think, ongoing attacks on minorities at various times, including under periods of Awami League rule, where um, you know, people have been uh, put under a lot of pressure as minorities, and, and talking to lawyers in Bangladesh, you know, people's <coughs> property has been taken and so on, and uh, many uh, parties have been involved in that in one way or another. Uh, there was still a sort of line in the sand that was able to be drawn in Bangladesh as a result of a national consciousness of the defeat, not only of the Pakistani army, but of fundamentalist forces within, within Bangladesh. And I think it's very important to remember that because, for instance, when we you know, hear talk about the uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa, um, you know, there's, there's sometimes a sense that as if um, issues of mass struggle in Muslim societies are new. They're not. I mean, um, you know, the, the majority of the Muslim population of the world is in, in, in Asia, uh, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in India, much larger than in the Middle East and North Africa. Secularism has been on the table in majority Muslim context for a very long time, and Bangladesh is one example of that. And it's possible to fight off um, and by struggle, I mean, not, not simply um, uh, th through the period of the, of, of the conflict, but through civil struggle um, to um, uh, fight off the forces um, of fundamentalism. But here in Britain around <coughs> that time, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, and I know this is 
a hard thing for you to talk about, but I think people will be very interested in hearing about it. You were still um, an activist, uh, uh, as, as, as you said, associated with, um, not just with the jamaat e islami but with a man by then called Kaleem Siddiqui, who um, I think was a very, very bad man. And uh, he was from Lucknow. For, uh, for, uh, and he came here, and he founded something called the Muslim Parliament. And can you tell us what role he played in um, promoting the fatwa on Rushdi? Uh, I think uh, <coughs> his contribution was that uh, um, I think he, in some respect he played a role in persuading or initiating uh, fatwa itself. Because I remember um, it was uh, fatwa was issued in February. 14th of February, 1989. 89, okay. I think uh, that's right. At that In February, uh, just a few days before the fatwa was issued, we had gone, uh, Dr. Klim Siddiqui and myself, uh, gone to Tehran to attend a conference there. And it just happened that on 14th of February, it is snowed heavily in Tehran. And uh, we were at the airport, and uh, all the foreign guests was departing. Uh, and Dr. Khatmi, who later became president of Iran, at that time, he was uh, Minister of Religious Affairs. So he appeared uh, at the airport, VIP lounge, and he met a uh, uh, number of delegates who were departing. But then he came to Dr. Kalim Siddiqui, Kalim, can I have a word with you? So they both went to a corner and have a word with each other. And uh, when he came back, I said, what did you talk about? <coughs> He said, well, uh, I was just uh, talking about uh, Rushdi. I said, well, look, this is a very dangerous book, and, uh, and uh, something has got to be done. And uh, I said, well, did you suggest anything? <laughs> so I, I, I yes, he said, I have told Khatmi that uh, uh, Imam has to intervene and do something. So the matter uh, ended. And because it was too much snow at the airport, the flights were cancelled, and we came back to our hotels. Uh, about two hours later, a young man uh, came running and uh, came to Dr. Khalif Siddiqui. Uh, you know, uh, because obviously uh, the fatwa was announced at the Tehran radio, we do not understand uh, Persian language, so we couldn't understand, we couldn't listen. So he came running and said, you know, Imam has a shoot fatwa against Rushdi. So obviously, the whole atmosphere became electrified. And, uh, and uh, after hearing this, two of us met to uh, discuss this whole issue. So uh, our friend, Brother Kalim Siddiqui, said, our time has come. And he said that, uh, well, we are now uh, shortly be going back to London. And when we arrive in London, obviously, there will be uh, because of fatwa coming from Iran, uh, there will be many journalists. I have got to think what I'm going to take uh, this. So he decided that uh, you know he's going to support the fatwa. And of course, the rest of the story is well known to all of you, most of you. So the uh, fatwa was an incitement to murder, in effect. Well, this is what it said. It was said, yes. It yes. was an order to kill. Well, this was the intentional or threat inherent in the fatwa, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, then as a result of that thing, a campaign was launched, and uh, which eventually gave birth to the parliament. And there was also, I mean, I think this, this it was an extremely... Um, uh, 
important campaign from many, many different points of view because it exposed fault lines in Britain. So, for instance, at that time, I was part of founded, helped to find, found among, with other women, a very small group called Women Against Fundamentalism. And uh, about 40 of us decided to stand on Parliament Square and uh, uh, support uh, the right to read what we wanted and to oppose blasphemy laws and oppose the fatwa and support Salman Rushdie. And there was a demonstration of at least 20,000 largely men, I think overwhelmingly Muslim men, walking past on the 26th or 27th of May um, from Hyde Park to Parliament. Now, you were centrally involved with that, were you not? Yes, indeed. And who were you working with? I mean, who, who were your, um, uh, the people that were active uh, along with you, who you negotiated with? And can you tell us uh, how you mobilized? Uh, within the Muslim group, uh, uh, there were two groups by then. One was uh, uh, Poros Saudis, who were against, of course, uh, uh, Salman Rishdi, but uh, not quite clearly pro-fatwa. But then there were other group, which were, uh, let's say, our group, uh, uh, who was, of course, uh, uh, against Salman Rushdie and uh, pro-fatwa. And it just happened that uh, just before this famous uh, uh, rally that you talked about, on the 7th of May, uh, 89, the pro-Saudi lobby which was, of course, led by Iqbal Sakrani, they declared that we are going to organize the rally. Now, just around that time, we were also thinking in those terms to organize something big, massive. And uh, when this news came, I said, well, that is good that they are doing it. So in other words, it requires a lot of resources to organize a massive demonstration. I said, good. So in other words, they have committed themselves to underwrite all the expenses. And, uh, and uh, because of my experience and training back in Pakistan as a student activist, I had perfected how to control demonstrations, demos, rallies. So I, I knew the techniques, how to uh, 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 take over and control and redirect. So I, I, I said well, to our friend Khalib Stiki that uh, this can be done. They organize it, but we take over. <laughs> and I, I said, but I need your permission because I mean, things can go wrong as well. Uh, he said, are you sure that you can do it? I said, very much, that uh, we can do it. So because the call has been made by Abbas Sakrani's group, <coughs> and in charge of that demonstration was our, our friend, Muin. Chaudhry Muin. Until then, I did not know him. That was the first time I met him. So we had to go to negotiate terms and conditions of that relationship. Uh, and uh, we, so the, uh, but we said that, look, you are doing it, but we also plan to do it. But at the same time, we thought it would be good if we go together. They were thrilled, because obviously, if there are two, they will get a smaller rally, and they, it will not have the kind of impact everybody was thinking. But we put certain conditions that uh, we will only cooperate, work together, if uh, we control the stage. We have the stage secretary. And on our side, we had a number of groups who were supporting our position. Uh, some of these were uh, in, 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 in Pakistani <coughs> society, the community is divided into various factions. One is, of course, Wahhabi, Salafi, Deobandis. The other is Barelwis. 
railways uh, are committed, known for their love for profit. So we had, they were on our side, obviously. So uh, we, uh, I spoke to one of the leaders, and I said, Look, uh, this is the plan, and we will insist that you become the secretary. He was thrilled, obviously. The crown was coming without effort. So, and then we planned in such a way that on that day, all those who were supportive of Bareilly position and Iraqi Shias, Pakistani Shias, and Iranian Shias, all I approached one by one to invite that, look, this is a event we can't lose, because obviously uh, either Saudis lose or win, or Imam wins. So they were obviously very supportive of this whole idea. And, uh, and the idea was that our supporters would, of course, go there, mingle, but carry different posters. The uh, uh, Saudis have taken posters, photographs of Fahad, for example. But on our side, we had uh, photographs, of portraits of Fahad, but garlanded with shoes, just to humiliate him, to insult him. Who was Fahad? Can you explain who he was? Sorry? Can you explain about the garlanding? You know, what, what, what was the difference between... No, no, I mean, those, well, I mean uh, the Saudis were funding mm -hmm. ultimately to show that we control the Muslim community in this country, and it is uh, behind uh, Saudi king that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have come. So we want to just show to the other side that Saudis do not control the masses, the other groups control, and to, to, to express our contempt for the Saudi ruler, we made sure that there will be poster garlanded with shoes rather than flowers, of course. And there were Khomeini posters and so on as well. Well, Khomeini posters some. as well, of course. So it was a coming together of the um, of the <coughs> the Shia and the pro Khomeini people. It was the the Jamaat and the fundamentalists. It was the Berelvis. And the irony is, in some ways, that many of the people who later were mobilized. Um, uh, 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 in in campaigns uh, against um, uh, what you know, who who, who were Muslim, even imams who were who obviously active in mosques and so on, but were anti Jamaat in Bangladesh were mobilized behind these banners, these various banners. No, I mean, but, but a very wide issue, range of no, people. But on that issue, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there were very little difference. Both were supporters of uh, uh, blasphemy and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah. although there was a difference in, in terms of national memories of the conflict, um, this issue was an issue that mobilized large numbers of people yes, across the spectrum of yeah. lots of different Muslim opinion. And one of the things that I find very interesting about your witness to this yeah. is that much of the discussion that we have in academic circles, for instance, says... For instance, Professor Maudud has argued that, uh, uh, you know, this was not a fundamentalist uh, uprising because the, the reason that um, uh, there was such a mass uh, rallying in Britain was that Bareilwis mobilized and Bareilwis particularly um, f find the person of the prophet precious. And this was very, and the, the, the satanic verses was therefore very insulting to them, specifically more insulting to them than to those from Salafi and Wahhabi traditions who are not so involved with the person of the Prophet. And uh, what I find interesting about this testimony is that you're talking about the political work that various factions of fundamentalists took to mobilize large numbers of people who were not necessarily fundamentalist, but who, did, who were mobilized on basically a, a very frightening platform of the issue of blasphemy and kufr and behind a death sentence. So I, you know, I think that was a, a, a very um, interesting moment. We'd hoped that we would have time to discuss 
what happened later, where we'd get to the anti-racists and the, and the peace movements and so on. So I'll just skip ahead and say that Dr. Siddiqui played a very honorable role. At the start of the war, he was involved with the Stop the War Coalition. He was elected um, uh, in the Stop the War Coalition as an office bearer. And that role ceased eventually when the SWP-led Stop the War Coalition made a formal alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood, where the Muslim Brotherhood stayed outside the coalition but became a formal, formalized partner where they organized Muslims on a communal basis. So we had, at the start of the war, the possibility of actually a mass mobilization on a very progressive issue, which um, doesn't, you know, it, it wasn't allowed to go forward because of the activities uh, of the left and the sidelining of Muslims who by then had changed their politics and moved uh, into a more secular uh, mode. And at the same time, I remember, because the film, the war crimes film was made in the mid 90s, and I thought when the war came, surely somebody must listen to understanding what the issues, you know, that there is an issue of Muslim fundamentalism that is taking the world stage at this point in time. And somebody should understand that this is an issue that we need to take account of. And I mean, I debated this issue with a number of uh, people from different kinds of backgrounds. Tariq Ramadan, the deputy head of the MCB, um, somebody um, from uh, Moazim Beg of Cage Prisoners and so on. And my argument there was that the government was allying, the Labour government was allying with the MCB, which it had helped to promote, which I said was a Jamaat associated group. Now, they didn't deny that they were allied with the government. What they spent all their time denying was that they were Jamaat Islami. They just said, we are not. So, what is your opinion of the MCB? I, I, I'm, I always hated them. So, uh, the, the, so uh, this is one. But I think what, the, you hated them from the left, and I mean from from the from the extreme in one sense, and now you hate them as a progressive. No, obviously, <laughs> obviously I have gone uh, uh, like zigzag way, learning from all experiences. Uh, but uh, but uh, but I think that to be fair, <coughs> British government has some two hundred fifty. 250 years experience dealing with Muslims. One of the things that they have learned is that if you want to control, manipulate, and use or misuse Muslim, that that route is through Islamism. And this is a technique, understanding they have perfected, and they use it all the time. And I think they were applying the same rule in dealing with the MCB. I mean, I know. MCB was, of course, allied with the uh, 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 British government at some stage. But later on, of course, uh, when they were denied this relationship, they became great critic of anybody who had that association, like, of course, our uh, friends like Gulliam Foundation. And I uh, met somebody who said, look, Gulliam is bad because of this. I said, look, it's only today uh, they have become uh, bad, but what about MCB, who was until yesterday were receiving all the money, and but in many the, cases nobody well. and nobody ever criticized them for that reason. So, so, so uh, obviously, for if you want to do something, you need money for whatever it comes from. But anyway, so uh, 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 for MCB, you know, as long as they commit a crime, it is of course Islamic, justified, of course. But it's only become illegal, haram, unacceptable when obviously they are denied or somebody else is involved in that operation. So I think on that note, I'm going to, um, we have a few minutes for um, questions. And uh, um, if anybody wants to, I saw a hand raised some time ago at the back. My question, Dr. Siddiqui, about the blasphemy law, we know what is happening in Pakistan, especially Christians and minorities being persecuted terribly, yeah. we know that. And I'm a Christian, I'm born a Christian, yeah. I'm a very committed Christian. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in, in my religion, that if anybody says against Jesus Christ, it is not our uh, 
there is not a responsibility to take any action against them. Like a uh, few years back, Elton John, he said Jesus was gay, but nobody reacted because it is not my uh, business to do that matter. It is God's business to do that matter. So, what is your opinion if someone says anything about uh, prophet? I think one has to learn the way Islam itself has developed. I mean, right at the very beginning, Prophet Muhammad created a community where even it was not necessary that the only thing that he was emphasizing was the people to become believers, believers in one God. Once they were believers, everything was acceptable. There was, it was not conditional that they also accept Muhammad as a prophet as well. So they could accept, continue to believe that Jesus was the prophet and they were believing in God. The same was true with, the, uh, with Moses, the Jews. So, but I think this lasted the first 90 years and slowly this whole emphasis on believers became turned into uh, uh, Muslims. And I think it's all part of uh, influence of Arab tribalism which has influenced Islamic history greatly, that we have seen all these things. There is no justification for blasphemy as far as Islam is concerned. It's man-invented, man-made. And in fact, uh, not very long ago, it was our uh, 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 would-be caliph, Ziaul Haq, General Ziaul Haq, who has invented this. And of course, ordinary people are suffering. This is unfair, unwanted, undesirable thing. So I'm sorry if your community has suffered. I, mean, I have read newspapers what happened to this young girl in Islamabad. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about this. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, Islam has been abused and abused and abused either for individual gain yeah. or for a country's gain. Now, when I was in Saudi Arabia, yeah. the audacity of a Saudi man telling me, huh? you said you are from Bangladesh? You should have been Pakistani or a Muslim. Yeah. He says, you accident is true. But why the hell you are a Saudi? Yeah. You speak the same language mm. like Iraqi, Syrian, yeah. Kuwaiti, but still you are different country. Yeah. And when I become different country, you <coughs> are angry that I'm not a Muslim. Because Pakistan's propaganda is very strong. Money, and even today, Gita, the Saudi money is influencing the British <coughs> thinker. Saudi money is polluting the whole civilization yeah. and the day will come, although the, they say Muslims believe that the Qiyamah is probably coming, it's my personal belief, because the way Muslims are going backward and backward and backward and becoming primitive and primitive and primitive, the whole world will one day will get up like the way the Western world and civilized world got up against Hitler. Well, this is true. I mean, as a result Thank you. of Let's Salafism, we have a uh, Muslim community is divided and divided and divided. Yes. Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Asif Muni about uh, the, the current situation in Bangladesh. We have seen in recent years that uh, the youth in Bangladesh is uh, very enthusiastic and interested about knowing the true history of, of our nation. And uh, despite the reversal of the 80s, when, uh, I mean, the, the religion was brought back in the politics. But uh, in the recent years, we have seen uh, among the youth of Bangladesh uh, that uh, they are really interested about liberalism and practice of like uh, accommodation and tolerance and, and so on, and also learning the true spirit of, the, of, the, of our liberation war. So uh, uh, do you, uh, Mr. Asif Pony, see any hope in Bangladesh that uh, the, a, 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 a proper liberal uh, democracy can be exercised? <laughs> Despite there is a fear that the, 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 some social basis for Islamic resurgence could, could, could still remain uh, in, in some part or in some, uh, some corner of the, of the society. So how do you see this, uh, this, this, these two things? This is my question to Mr. Asif Pony. Yeah, I'm not sure, sure about the liberal democracy part, but you're right about the, <clears throat> the sort of new generated interest among the younger generation, people who are in their 20s or even, you know, teens. And I would say, you know, part of it probably is due to the, you know, the expansion of the internet, the IT revolution, you know, use of Facebook and 
a lot of uh, information is out there because like i mean you know we talked about it a little bit that propaganda was very strong even in 1971 the pakistani propaganda machine even now in pakistan in the age of information you know explosion i personally have met in pakistan people in different places in pakistan who believe that what happened in 1971 was a uh, war between india and pakistan and because of india we lost a muslim brother i mean it's very uh, you know distressing to know about this and this is from a people who are kind of of this internet generation anyway but in bangladesh yes very much so and also you know one of the basic things about the bengali culture it has a rich tradition of folk culture and a lot of you know the arts and the theater and the music and that has kind of had a revival in the last 10 years or so you know you can say a lot of the fusion music coming up and all of that but a lot of the traditional uh, music and uh, the history actually has been brought back so which has kind of you know you use a lot of the uh, old tunes but repackage it and it has kind of generated an interest and particularly i would say I mean, you mentioned something about the you know the propaganda now that this is the kind of like the trial at the moment is very political i mean it was because of the pressure from the civil society groups that the current political regime had to take this into their their uh, political agenda because prior to that back in the 19 2005 6 7 around that time there was a lot of movement around that Uh, not just from the different civil society groups but uh, a kind of growing cultural activism and which has created an interest i know of art students who have on their own uh, you know started to talk about things or wanting to know and i would say that uh, in the last 10 years more than ever there is kind of an interest to know about it but in terms of liberal democracy you know i have question marks about that because you know the political culture in bangladesh is an, another debate another discussion it's a culture of exploitation uh, you know one party against the other and all of that so you know i myself i am an activist on from the streets uh, asking for democracy but you know i have been disillusioned as well with any political party in bangladesh who have been in power and yes and i I think the purpose of this discussion as we said um uh, Dr. Siddiqui if you hand me the, there's a leaflet next to you I'll, um, talk about that 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 uh, there will be a discussion on issues connected with the International Crimes Tribunal I think there are uh, a lot of critiques that are legitimate there are also a lot of critiques that are politically inspired so I think we need to disentangle um many of those things and I think that one of the things that I would like to say is actually when people say why is the leadership being um indicted of um you know opposition political parties i'd ask the opposition parties why they they promoted people who had these allegations against them where these <laughs> allegations were known um they they haven't been proved in court but the fact is that there are serious allegations against a number of people and it what it seems to be like that certain political parties have promoted people on the basis of their record in the war and i think that is very frightening so i think we need to turn that question around and i think even young activists in the jamaat and its associated groups in britain need to ask that question of their leaders oh sorry okay sorry yeah and then you yeah i know this is the center of a sacred space but i'm a bit surprised uh, whatever position you're from that the genocide and is the worst genocide in the history of Bangladesh has been sort of used to frame the whole subject solely in terms of Rushdie and, and the whole phenomenon that secularism I understand and particularly Islamophobia because obviously Christianity is mentioned as being philosophically peaceful which of course it is but not historically but in the context of Bangladesh I mean Bangladesh has a long history of genocide this is not the first genocide this is the worst one and of course it was Islamism it was Jamaat it was Pakistan shoring up its failure and identity in the fact of partition 
But if we consider that in 1943, maybe two million people were killed intentionally with the support of the civil servant for Churchill, who denied food supplies that were being sold on the international market, and Hindu and Muslim in Bengal were slaughtered by starvation. And of course, after 1857, in Delhi and beyond, we see the hanging of the middle class by the British Empire throughout India. And this is not a post-colonial or even an Islamist response as is being framed. But the phenomenon of being disempowered 250 years ago and specifically kept weak by institutional policy in the empire through starvation and degradation of the system would obviously contribute directly to the capacity for Pakistan to invade. I mean, we were unarmed. The whole phenomenon I'm trying to suggest is very simplistic or slightly Islamophobic to mention it in terms of Islam, radical Islam, and the seculars, when Bangladesh was already on its knees for over two centuries, destroyed. And of course, Bengal, just to finish, were the primary protagonists of the Congress Party and the Muslim League. I mean, all the political movements and change in India came out of Bengal and nowhere else. So what I'm saying is that the subject of Bangladesh, uh, like Gandhi, was, uh, Gandhi was a Gujarati, and no, Gandhi was not the only one. Of course, and, uh, and all the others. There were a few. Wait, see, there were a few other. <laughs> okay, okay, I think we've got to a point, and we, we I would like the panel to be able to address I'm this. Being, I'm from Bangladesh. <laughs> the reference to Bangladesh, only in terms of the frame of Pakistan or India, or secularism, is quite insulting, because its history and its reality of this genocide and the previous few centuries is very clear and very particularly employed by the British uh, as for many reasons, and this is the effect of it. Now we have an army, and now we have independence and internationalism. We shall see what will happen in the next 50 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, somebody. I'll try to, I'll try to ask a really quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so my background is, uh, my, both my parents are Jamaat al-Islamiya. Uh, I'm an ex-Muslim, and I've been working with ex-Muslims in the UK internationally. Um, and, I mean, with Mr. Siddiqui, what, what, you know, what, with what you're doing in terms of, you have this background, and then you've sort of essentially come out and said, this is what I think, this is what I believe. Um, what hope do you think there is for being able to say that in the UK even, but also in Bangladesh and Pakistan, where there are people, there's an, I mean, especially on the internet, like you were saying, is a massive community of people who either they're secularists, they're, they're you know, they're ex-Muslims, whatever, who don't follow the, the general narrative. Uh, and they're usually young. I mean, there's a lot of, sort of it, but it tends to be young youth. Is there a hope there for that to be accepted by civil society in the future, especially in those countries, as well as in the UK? I think with internet and all these new technology, it's becoming so common, widespread, available. I think uh, uh, the argument coming from same scholars <coughs> also have equal opportunity, chance, to influence Muslim public opinion and others. And the hope is that uh, they will <coughs> ultimately, eventually win. We are very hopeful. I think there's somebody else. Uh, I think there was, was a hand there. It was probably a follow-up from a question was asked to Munir. It's about um, the amount of funding that is going to Bangladesh from Middle East. It's probably not one of the only sources of money because we, as I've been resident in the UK for the last five years in the local TV channels and any local Muslim awareness, what I see is a massive amount of money is raised by the name of Islam. Yeah. And it's actually a large portion of it is sent to Bangladesh or probably many other countries across, but as I'm focusing more on the Bangladeshi community. So it is been used in Bangladesh for religious training, madrasas, majority of it. You don't really see much implementation or much use of this money for schools or hospitals. So as long as this money is going to Bangladesh, along with the Saudi or the Middle Eastern monies, it is a source of funding of this problem creation and as a member of this local community where you work a lot with this, is there any awareness that you're trying to grow here that most of these people were funding just seeing a program on the TV, most of the people doesn't really understand how their money actually spent in countries like Bangladesh. So is there any program of awareness you're trying to do? Very slowly. I think what uh, people ought to realize or some are realizing, there are already some 
14 religious channels from London or, or London, Manchester, a few places. And they all promote their sectarian agenda. Uh, uh, and, which, and Dr. Siddiqui, prominent anti-racists appear on those channels. I know. They use those channels in order to spread their messages. And I don't understand how you can be an anti-racist, which means anti-discrimination against anybody, and it should be based on skin color or religion or anything like that, yeah. and appear on channels that promote discrimination. Yeah, but uh, well, I think one is I don't see any of them because I see it as a distraction and creating uh, confusion, whether I should promote and accept this sector, this sector, that sector, because individually, if you find their agenda is to convert all the other to their way of <coughs> belief, and, uh, or, uh, and indirectly eliminate all the others. So it creates <coughs> confusion, uh, uh, discord, disharmony, and I think, uh, uh, so I think the best way is, one is to ignore them as much as possible. The other is that coming back to these charities, see, the, I personally believe and I say to that even in this country there is poverty. We don't talk about it. And when you send money to Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever, there is no accountability. I mean, I know some uh, charities. They collect, of course, money. Now, who knows what happens when the money reaches to Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever. Often their family members, their friends are beneficiaries. Uh, uh, or their political movements. And I, political movements. You, yes. you remember, Dr. Siddiqui, that we, we, I mean, one of the times we began to work together was in a group that uh, sadly is defunct now, but I hope that the Center for Secular Space will be able to take on some of the work that we did, which was, it was called Avaaz South Asia Watch, yeah. not the Avaaz that's very well known that's in, um, that, you know, uh, that's a petition site. We were a local group of activists, which included um, people from minorities all across South Asia, um, Dalits, Christians, um, and others, and also uh, many of us who are irreligious, uh, atheists like myself, um, Muslim reformers like uh, Dr. Siddiqui. And the first big piece of work we did was on the Hindutva movement, um, because this was just after the Gujarat massacre, where um, around 2,000 Muslims were massacred in Gujarat, um, uh, and about 100,000 displaced by uh, the Hindu right, um, Hindu fundamentalist political parties and the, the militias uh, that they work with. And um, so we did a report on the charities in this country that were actually Hindutva charities and how they're sending money abroad. And we sent that report to the Charities Commission, which uh, produced a disappointing response. But it did cut into the fundraising of the charities, and other activists raised it. It was very interesting the way it was raised. <coughs> For instance, people who, um, you know, uh, in local areas and uh, were, were raising money spontaneously for things like um, an earthquake or something like that and wanting to send money to India, then challenged the fact that this money was going into those kind of charities. We also did a less successful piece of work on, uh, I mean, it was a very good piece of work, but it was much more contested, called Key Tendencies of the Islamic Right, where we mapped the political front organizations in Britain of various tendencies. Um, and uh, I think, you know, without the support of Dr. Siddiqui, we couldn't have done uh, that work. And, and Ansar Ahmadullah and many other people who, were, who, from various different perspectives, con contributed their knowledge. But what was interesting about it was that any time you try and talk about Muslim fundamentalism, it becomes contested even within progressive groups and movements. So I found that it was impossible to talk about these things within spaces that were supposedly against fundamentalism and were happy to talk about the Pope and Christian fundamentalism or Hindu fundamentalism or many other kinds of fundamentalism, but not Muslim fundamentalism. And I think that's really been one of our problems. And I, I mean, I want because, to say thank because, you to you because no, you defended because, me several times when I did talk about it. But and, I think, I think you know. because I think we have to remember one uh, little thing. Muslim agenda is controlled by Salafist or tendencies close to that. And I think once we understand, then you can find that we may be liberal in certain aspects, 
but deep down we carry the strains and viruses of uh, that problem. So that is one of the things. May I ask quickly, uh, the Salafist you mentioned, uh, where is the root at this point? Is it in Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan? Where is the more power? Where is it being controlled from? Where is the root in Britain? Where the, yes, that was actually my question. Where is the Salafist? Is it in Britain now? Where is it rooted? Well, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's like a virus. It's, it's a virus, yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, it was certainly one thing we can say that is funded by Saudi petrodollars. Yeah. And there is not a small change. It's billions and billions. And in fact, for, uh, uh, you see, when Burton uh, decided to promote this family of Saud in, uh, 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 in Riyadh, they decide, they, in return for their sef safety and security, they were offered two things. First to, of course, Britain when they were world power, and then to Americans. One was oil, and the other was an ideology, Salafism, which can be used to destabilize and destroy everything we will touch. So these, uh, you know, they have uh, immense power. Uh, so. But uh, Saudi coming at the Salafist or Wahhabi? They are Both. together. Same. Same. Together. Yeah. Slight variation. I, I think we, we have to close this down. I'm afraid it's been, for me, a very, very good discussion. I hope you found but it interesting. But there's just something I, I just, just, before you close, <laughs> there's one hand is rising there. No, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask Asif to make some concluding comments. And I'm going to, uh, just before he does that, I'm going to announce a meeting that's taking place on the 14th of December um, uh, called the International Crimes Tribunal Bangladesh in Perspective. It's a presentation and question time. Uh, I think people who work on law issues have many concerns around the tribunal and they'd want to address them. So this is um, uh, a group of independent global, net, uh, independent global network of activists and organizations um, which are spread out across different con continents who are working around the issues of the tribunal. And they're committed to redressing international crimes, ending impunity. It's a civil society network um, working around these things. Um, because this kind of activism has really mainly been done um, you know, outside the formal human rights framework, although using um, the human rights framework. Can so I, ask, can ask if I'd like you to. If, can I yeah. say a few words? I just want to yeah, say a couple of things. Where oh, sorry. It's um, the, the leaflet is going to be handed out. It's here at SOAS, but at Vernon Square. There's another campus at SOAS, Vernon Square on Penton Rise, WC1, and it's. Um, oh, I don't have a time here. Can anybody tell us the time of the meeting? No, but at the, I've got the leaflet, and I don't see a time. I don't know if I'm just not seeing it. Six. Six p.m. 6 p.m. on the 14th of December. Uh, just okay, uh, just okay. Some uh, just sorry about this. I simply want to say why. Yeah, it's right here. Sorry, 6 p.m. Yeah. Why I decided to participate in this event because I'm deeply hurt for Jamaat -e Islami using Islam to support the objectives and plans of Pakistan army. That is deep down my reason why I decided this uh, uh, meeting ought to be supported and given uh, credence. And the other thing is that I hope in the interest of all of us that, uh, uh, that the tribunals that are uh, going on in Dhaka will be transparent, accountable, and have honest and just conclusion for the future of Bangladesh and for all those who have given life and those who have been dishonored. It is their sacrifices we must honor and make sure that these trials are transparent and accountable and just and fair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. Yeah, maybe just uh, to resonate that a little bit, yes, of course, uh, not just as a uh, uh, from the family of the victims, but also as a nation's conscience, I feel that uh, these trials need to go forward. Just a quick comment that uh, there has been, again, uh, to reiterate that 
the International uh, Crimes Tribunal and the trials that are being held now is a culmination of uh, mass support and civil society support and movement uh, from the 1990 onwards. So, you know, the claim that uh, it's only a political, only politically motivated is uh, ridiculous. And uh, just before this meeting, I mean, you know, as we were all preparing, uh, some of the numbers that I came through, I mean, of course, the numbers in terms of how many died and raped and all those are contested, and some of us have heard it again and again. But some numbers, I just quickly mentioned the numbers in terms of our thought process as you go, uh, go away from here. Uh, again, these can be contested, but uh, I've seen this in different places, more or less. In 1971, 80,000 armed Pakistani troops were involved in Bangladesh, in East Pakistan. 25,000 militia forces, 50,000 Rajakar al Badr al Shams members, 175,000 liberation fighters or Mukti Jodhas. Towards the end, 250,000 Indian troops were involved, who supported, and 91,000 prisoners of war uh, were incarcerated in India and later handed over. Um, it just, I suppose, falls to me to thank you all for your time this evening. Um, all of the speakers have given us an awful lot to think about. Um, and I would ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Siddiqui, Asif Munir, and Gita Sable.